Hallelujah. Father God, we come together, one mind, one body, Lord, in one accord. And Lord God, we bring these prayer requests before you. First off, we give you praise for who you are and thank you for all that you're doing in our lives. You are a mighty God and we worship you, Lord God, with all of our heart. Father, I lift up this nation which is the great empire of the United States, which reaches around the world. And I pray, Lord God, that you would, Lord, shake it, shake its leaders, Lord God, and cause righteousness, Lord God, to go forth and turn, God, people's hearts to you, Lord, and also in Canada, Lord. And, Lord, you know the government there, and, and you know the needs there, Lord. And I do believe, Lord God, that, we are in the last days, and, and, Lord, that you can speak concerning a nation, and, Lord God, you can turn a nation. You can turn the people. You can turn, Lord God, the political agenda that the enemy has, Lord God. So I just ask, Father God, in Jesus' name, that you would watch over this nation and the people in it, Lord God, that are looking to you, Lord God, for their help. Lord God, be strong on their behalf, Lord God, and make a way for them in the days ahead. Father, I pray for uh, D. I don't know these people, but I, from what I know, Lord God, he passed away and left a, a, a widow and children. And Lord God, I just pray for them, Lord God, that you would touch their hearts. Lord God, that you would open their eyes. And Lord God, that you would comfort them. Lord God, that you're the understanding of you, Lord God, and the knowledge of you, Lord God, would just overwhelm whatever grief and sorrow they have, Lord God. Touch their hearts and turn them to you, Lord, I pray. Yes. I lift up my wife, Christine, her knee, Lord God, the surgery that she had in it years ago, Lord God. From time to time it hurts, Lord God, and it aches. And Lord God, I know you can take the pain away, Lord God, that you can correct it, Lord. And I pray, Lord God, for the Bible study tonight, Lord God, that your word will go forth, Lord God, and it will accomplish that which you'll have it to do in our lives. Thank you, Father God, Lord, for watching over us, for hearing our requests, and being faithful, Lord, in all things. We give you all the praise and all the glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Coral. Uh, let me uh, share the screen here. And we're going to be in, this, we're going back to the scroll, we're in Matthew 16, 1 through 4. Uh, Ed, are you up for reading or do you want me to just do it? Eddie B. Okay. Hey, I was having trouble uh, undoing my um, microphone there. Okay. Are you I up for reading? Okay, <laughs> great. Well, let's go ahead and, and just start right in then on Matthew 16, 1 through 4. Let me make this a little bigger here. Okay. <coughs> now, uh, we have a praise report. Kathy's blood pressure came down. It did. I forgot to say that. It, it is back to normal. It was very high. And, uh, and it, you know, she's going in for oral surgery at the, the beginning of the year, and they needed her blood pressure to come down, and it's come back down to normal. So, yes, you're, you're absolutely right. I'm glad you brought that up. Thank the Lord. Yeah, That's I love prayer. it when we get those answers on prayer that fast. Oh, absolutely. And I, you're right. It was oversight on my part. Thank no God. Problem. He does answer prayer. Okay, uh, Matthew 16, 1 through 4, and the uh, same scriptures are in Mark 8, 11 through 13. The Pharisees also, with the Sadducees, came and tempting, desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said unto them, When it is evening, ye say, it will be fair weather. For the sky is red, and in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O oh, ye hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but, ye, but can ye not discern the signs of the times? A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, 
and there shall be there shall no sign be given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonas and he left them and departed I find it ludicrous that with all the divine healing and miracles such as the dead being raised that had already been done by Jesus that the Pharisees and Sadducees would say show us a sign from heaven what more exactly did they need to see their questioning exposed them as a wicked and adulterous generation because it was obvious that they really were not seeking the truth today it's much Diff it's not much different. People hear of the many miracles taking place in their family and friends' lives, not to mention their changed lifestyles as a result of them being born again, but refuse to acknowledge the truth. What greater sign could they need <clears throat> to show that Jesus has been raised from the dead? If he were still dead, how could he be doing all these things the past 2,000 years. And that is the sign of the prophet Jonas. Okay, and if you'll keep reading here. Okay, Matthew 12, 40 and 41. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation, and shall condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah's. And behold, the greater than Jonah is here. So just as Jonah survived three days and three nights in the whale's belly, Jesus obviously survived three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, and he continues to save and change lives every day, proving that to those who want the love of the truth, which unfortunately are not many. So that's the, you know, the, I, again, why does Jesus say an adulterous, you know, uh, a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign? Because he's already been giving them repeated signs. I mean, we're talking about how multitudes have been coming to Jesus from all over. And, you know, they were spending days without eating to follow him, to listen, to be healed. And he healed the multitudes. And in some places, he healed them all. And then the Pharisees and the Sadducees, were, well, show us a sign. Like, I mean, what in the world? It's so ridiculous. So that's why Jesus said this is an adulterous and a wicked generation, that, you know, you, you're denying the, the mighty power of God and you want to see something else. You know, it's it's like uh, it, it, it's like one time I, I had I was ministering at a church, and it was right after the Florida lottery had had been legalized. You know, they were legally doing the Florida lottery, and uh, afterwards I I called for a prayer request and for people to come up to get prayer, and I had this fellow come up and his prayer request was that if God would just he said pray for me preacher that the Lord would Cause me to win the lottery, and if he'll if he'll allow me to win the lottery, I'll you know then I will bless. I'll use it to help people. And I just frankly told him, I said I can't pray for you for that. You know I will pray for the will of God in your life to be done, but I I cannot pray that prayer. Uh, you know it's a wicked and adulterous generation when when what we're looking for is you know is not really the truth. It's not the love of the truth. It's not, we, we're looking, we want to manipulate God. And that is a wicked and adulterous generation. The, 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 the group that wants to manipulate God into him doing what they want, rather than not my will, but thy will be done. And so the, the sign of the prophet Jonas was the fact that, you know, Jesus has resurrected. I mean, Jonas, he didn't resurrect from the dead, but in a sense he did because he was in the whale's belly for three days. He should have been dead, you know, but he didn't die. But, I mean, technically, I guess you could live through all of that. But obviously uh, we know that Jesus has definitely resurrected because he continues 
to perform the same life-changing miracles and life-changing salvation that he is doing to multitudes down through the ages and in our day. And here we are testifying to the reality of that. And yet we have people that in our day that, that won't receive it either, you know. Okay, uh, let's go on to Matthew sixteen five through 12. Okay. And when his disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. Which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves because you have brought no bread? Do you not yet understand, neither remember the five loaves of the five thousand, and how many baskets ye took up, neither the seven loaves of the four thousand, and how many baskets ye took up? How is it that you do not understand that I spoke it not of you concerning bread, that you should be aware, be aware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees? Then understand they how he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Lord takes advantage of every situation such as they had forgotten to take bread, to teach us. If when we just have ears to hear, every mistake we make, we can turn into a teachable moment. And what we see is that Jesus spends a lot of time harping on being aware of the leaven, the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees, and those who aren't interested in the love of the truth keep insisting that doctrine doesn't matter even though jesus said beware these who minimize the importance of doctrine are the simple ones the scripture speaks of proverbs 14 15 the simple believe every word but the prudent man looketh well to his going now why did i put that proverb in there because there are just too many christians in churches today that they just believe whatever is is preached to them from the pulpit or whatever some preacher on TV says or in the in you know in some revival meeting they don't put stuff to the test and you know what does the bible tell us in uh first john it says try the spirits to see which are of god we have got to be we don't want to be simple minded so let's keep reading a little bit about simple here, okay? And and particularly, yeah. bear, bear this in mind, as we read about the simple, it's be, we're talking about Jesus is warning us about the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And the only way that anyone can understand why we have to be beware of the doctrine of the Pharisees is because you know and understand sound doctrine and can identify the error of the Pharisees and Sadducees, okay? So the simple-minded are people who don't want to take the time and do what's necessary to be informed. So let's talk about simple here, okay? So we just read Proverbs 14, 15. So if you'll pick it up and so how? So how do we avoid being simple? Psalm 19:7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Making wise the simple. The law of the Lord, the scriptures. That's what makes the simple-minded wise. Okay, keep going. Sorry, Ed. What is the testimony of the Lord? John 5:39. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they are they which testify of me. Second Timothy 3:15 through 17. 
and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So remember, we want we want to be aware of the doctrine and, you know, be aware. In other words, avoid it and reject the doctrine of the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And, uh, and we don't want to be simple-minded. And, you know, just like, I mean, and here's a perfect example of a simple-minded Christian. It's the one that says, well, I know they, they, I know they don't believe, you know, the right doctrine, but they love the Lord. Well, we'll see. Let's see what scriptures I, I bring out here, and, uh, and then I'm going to bring some out I'm, that maybe I haven't put here tonight, but we'll, we'll see. If you'll pick it up in Psalms 119, 130, Ed. Okay. The entrance of thy words give light. It gives understanding unto the simple. Proverbs 1, 22 and 23. How long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. Proverbs 14, verse 15. The simple believe every word, but the prudent man looketh well to his going. If we expect to avoid being simple, we need to study to show ourselves approved of God, 2 Timothy 2.15, and it is the doctrine of Christ that we must study. 2 John 1, 9 through 11 whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ has not God. He that abides in the doctrine of Christ he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's speed. For he that bideth him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. I cannot emphasize enough how important sound doctrine is to our success. As Jesus warned us, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So we are warning people to beware of the religious teaching of our times. Titus 1, 9 through 11, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things that, which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. And listen, we know many people who are out there teaching certain doctrines, and their whole motivation is money. It's, you know, they... they they, they're willing to tell people what they want to hear, saying smooth things, preaching smooth things, because they want money in return. And so they're willing to say whatever they need to say, tell people what they want to hear so that they can enrich themselves. So do, why is doctrine so important? So back here in Second John 1 and 9, who abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. I can't, how, how, how do you minimize the importance of what John is saying there? He's telling you plainly, if you follow the wrong doctrine, you will not have God. So we must Pay attention to doctrine. So this idea that 
you hear Christians say, oh, well, doctrine's not, it's not important. That's not what really counts. Love is what counts. Well, you know, the truth is, love only matters if you obey the commandments of the Lord. And the only way you can understand the commandments of the Lord is to understand sound doctrine. So if you say that you love God, but you don't keep his commandments, the Bible says you are a liar and the truth is not in you. That's what the scripture says. So I would say for people who say that doctrine is not important, they're simple minded. And the only thing I can hope and pray for them is that they would have an epiphany. They would come to understand that you cannot remain willfully ignorant because that's a choice that you make. God has put in the heart of every believer a desire to seek out the truth. But people compromise that desire that God puts in their heart for whatever reasons, because they, they want to get along, because they don't want people to reject them, because they, they want to be appreciated by everybody. Well, what did Jesus say? Well, be careful because, you know, the people spoke well of the false prophets, but they're not going to speak well of those that speak the truth in love. So, you know, look, we, we cannot allow ourselves to do things because we want to be accepted of others. Uh, you know, the truth will divide. It is intended to do that. And so we must adhere to the love of the truth. Anybody want to add anything before we move on here? Yeah, I've got something. Great. If, it, if the false teachers were that bad back in those days, right after the Lord was here and then resurrected into heaven, they were running rampant. Every one of the apostles were warning people about how bad these t uh, false teachers were. And then you can imagine what it's like nowadays. It's multiplied like a thousand times what it was back then. And well, to, I, I to, agree. To me, yeah, to me, I've always thought, I was wondering, how do these people... Uh, believe all these lies, the prosperity doctrine, once saved, always saved. You can just reel them off one at a time. And the, the, what my answer was is that they don't know the word of God. That is the key to finding out whether how to discern whether somebody's telling the truth or not. And the, exactly. Yeah, the last thing I would add on, I hope you didn't put it in here, <laughs> you might down the road, was about the Bereans. When they heard pre people preaching, they would run back and check the scriptures to see if they were telling the truth, if it lined up with the word of God. They didn't take it at face value. They wanted to see if this guy was telling exactly what the scriptures said. And that's how they were able to discern whether someone was lying or not. And believe me, they are all over the place. That's exactly true. You're so right, Ed. I couldn't agree more. You know, and the thing that I want us to also understand is that, you know, the powers of darkness have been working at this for many years. You know, they, they, they have a lot more experience than we do. But we have the Holy Ghost within us. And he quickens his word to us, thank God, because we're not, we're not in the same situation as Eve was in the garden. I know it's hard for people to understand that, but Eve did not have the Holy Ghost abiding in her. That is a new covenant reality. It only has happened in the new covenant. And, uh, and we'll actually touch on that later on in this, in, in, if we get there tonight. We'll, we'll see. If not, we'll, we'll do it next week. But, you know, when the devil approached her and said, oh, did God say that you, you know, he no she didn't have the Holy Ghost to quicken the word to her. 
so she was at a, a, a at a much greater disadvantage than we are those of us that are in the new covenant the word is so important and we cannot cease to learn it more and more all the time the better we know it the better we're going to be in a, in a better position to combat the powers of darkness that are warring against us and warring against the minds of those around us you know it, it's so important so how we how are we going to fight it we have to exhort with sound doctrine and convince people with sound doctrine as we just read in Titus 1 uh, 10 here and 11 uh, uh, 9 10 through 11 or 9 through 11 all right let's go on to uh, mark 8 22 through 26 okay and he come comes to Bethsaida and said and they bring a blind man unto him and besought him to touch him and he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town and when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him he asked him if he saw aught and he looked up and said I see men as trees walking after that he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up and he was restored and saw every man clearly and he sent him away to his house saying neither go into the town nor tell it to any in the town the message is not just about the blind man being able to see better than appearing like trees I think we can understand that Jesus does not want us in confusion being unsure of what we are seeing the Lord will not be satisfied until we can see things as he sees them. The truth must not be obscured or blurred. It must be understood clearly. Unfortunately, many are blurring the truth to say what it does not. As we have seen, this is not the first time that Jesus asked those he heals neither go into the town nor tell it to any in the town we know that these miracles cannot be hidden people will know what happened they will see that the blind man has been healed even if he doesn't mention it so maybe what the Lord is saying is that he doesn't want the blind man bringing attention to himself we know the carnal nature will try to take the glory for itself I have seen people sharing their testimony, but it is more about their glorying rather than to the Lord. It becomes more about them being the center of attention. I trust you understand what I mean. So, again, um, well, the, the first point was is that, you know, Jesus, when he, when he prayed for him, he said, well, I... I see men walking like trees. So he wasn't really seeing clearly. He wasn't focusing completely clearly. Now, the the thing that I considered about this was, well, I mean, was Jesus' prayer ineffective? Or was it a teachable moment? And that's why I make the point that I'm saying here, is that it was a teachable moment. It's like the Lord doesn't want us to just partially see you know, it's like, no, I'm going to labor with you until you see like I see. I want you to be able to see clearly. And that is what the Lord is doing in our lives. He's helping us focus clearly. And, you know, we read the scriptures and we say we see, but sometimes we don't see clearly enough. And he's laboring with us, trying to get us to see things clearly, like the man who first saw the men as trees walking. But, uh, you know, after Jesus spent some more time with him, praying with him, he was restored and saw every man clearly. And so we, too, got to spend some more time with Jesus and make sure that we're seeing things clearly. And uh, and then this other situation about when Jesus says, neither go into town or tell it to any in the town. You know, I, I, <laughs> I kind of laugh whenever I see these things because it's like, uh well, I mean, everybody knows that this guy's blind, right? That he's, <laughs> and, of course, they're going to know that he's no longer blind because it's not something that you can hide. You know, so 
uh, it, 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 you know, why would Jesus say that to people? Because it's obvious that people are going to know. You can't, you can't hide those kind of things. So maybe I'm giving that us to think about. I have seen people, when they testify about what the Lord has done for them, it's more about them than it is about giving glory to the Lord. And I, all I can say when I say is, I, I, you know, I trust that you know what I'm talking about, that I, it, I'm sure you've seen it too. And listen, I have prayed because I never wanted to be guilty of that. And I've often said, Lord, if if it if it, if at all I was trying to get glory, please forgive me, because it's not about that. It's about letting people know the the truth and letting people know who changed my life. You know, it. it but honestly, I, I have heard people testify, and it's almost like they're trying to outdo one another. Like, oh, well, I was a worse sinner than you were. I was a bigger doper than you. I was a worse alcoholic. It's not about that. It's about the fact that Jesus Christ changed your life, whether you were a big doper or a little doper, whether you were a, a, didn't do drugs at all. I, You know, I, having been a drug addict and... I have testified in churches and, and, you know, in meetings over the years. And there have been times that I've had people come up to me afterwards and say, brother, I don't have a testimony like yours. How? Nobody's going to listen to me. I have no testimony. And I tell them, I said, you know, I had this one sister would tell me, I have no testimony, brother. I've, I've been raised in the church. I've, I've never gone into the world. And, you know, and I said, well, sister, that is the greatest testimony because you can testify that the love of God has kept you and you didn't have to go. I mean, you know, the point is it's not about us. It's about Jesus. It's about pointing people to Jesus, not us. Anybody want to add anything before we go on? Okay, Matthew sixteen thirteen through 28. Okay. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elijah, 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 or Elias in Greek, and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? This is the main question. Whom say ye that I am? There are many opinions about Jesus, about what Jesus teaches, but your opinion is what matters. We can't have a relationship with Jesus based upon what others say of him. We must know him for ourselves. We must individually be instructed of the Lord. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. And John 6:45. It is written in the prophets that they shall all they shall be all taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hear, hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. 1 John 2.27, But the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you, and you need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you of all things, and is truth and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, you shall abide in him. You know, over the years, uh, and, and I don't want to uh, discourage people from going to meetings and hearing people preach and testify. That, that's not the point. But what I do want to point out is that I have seen some Christians that get completely preoccupied with, well, I have to go to this brother's meeting, and I've got to go hear this brother. He's got such an anointed message and and look and i i understand that there is truth to that but what i am addressing is there are some people that that's all they do 
and they don't spend time with the Lord. And it's not what, you know, you can't just go around listening to what other people think or say that Jesus did to their lives. It's about you walking with the Lord and being able to say what he has done to your life. So they, when it says they shall all be taught of God, you're going to have to spend time with the Lord, not just going from revival to revival and listening to this preacher and that preacher. And this, you know, you need not that any man teach you. The same anointing teacheth you of all things and is truth and is no lie. There's nothing greater than having the presence of God in our lives. And we've got to learn how to lean on that and depend upon him and trust him. I will say this. It is a slow process. God's revelation, the revelation of, of the truth. Yes, it, it, you, you know, the night that you got saved or the day that you got saved, it was revelatory. I remember when I got saved that night, I couldn't sleep. I just kept saying out loud, I kept saying, wow, this is real. Jesus is real. But I have learned so much since then. I knew nothing. And it's a slow process to be taught of God. But it's worth doing because having that relationship is what it's all about. It, it's not what other people's opinion is about Jesus. It's what your opinion is. It's about your relationship with him. Okay, we'll pick it up in verse 16. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Let us understand that we cannot look to man to have this living relationship with the living God. You will not find, uh, you will not find it just by reading books about other people's experience with God. You must spend time with him alone developing that personal relationship. Matthew 6.6, 6, But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut the, thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. You're not going to have that relationship by reading other people's experiences. Now, again, I'm not saying that there isn't value in hearing other people's testimony. But I am saying there's a point where we spend too much time doing that, and we don't spend enough time with the Lord himself, with, with, that, with our primary relationship. That's the point. Okay, verse 18, if you would, Ed. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There are those that teach the rock is faith, but you can have faith like the devil and tremble, James 2.19, but the relationship is what God wants to build, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So that's the point that I'm making. When, it, when he says, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock, you know, what was the rock that Peter said, you know, you're the one, Lord. Uh, you, you, you know, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. It's upon that relationship, that revel revelation that God alone can give us. That's the rock. It's about developing that revelation, that relationship that matters. Okay, uh, 19. And I will give unto thee the, kings, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Many spend, t spend time trying to discover the keys of the kingdom, looking for some formula or methodology 
that they can employ to get the Lord to do their bidding. But it's about the relationship. After all, who gives us the keys? It can't be found in a book. And you can't pick it up at a revival meeting. You can't buy it with an offering. Acts 8.20, But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. You can't buy it. You can't give enough. I don't care if you give everything. That's not how you're going to get the keys of the kingdom. And the keys of the kingdom, it is the relationship. It's all about that. Uh, let's keep reading here. Uh, the Lord longs for those who, in turn, long to spend their time in his presence. Okay, and let's keep reading. Lamentations 3.25, The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh them. When the Lord states, Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven, it should be understood that what we ask must be according to his will. 1 John 5, 14 and 15. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. So again, people are trying to figure out, how, how can I get the keys of the kingdom of heaven so that when I pray, to God, you know, it's about doctrine. It's about knowing the truth, the love of the truth. Because that leads us to have the proper relationship with him. And when we have that sound doctrine, when we have been taught of God, when we have been instructed in the way of righteousness, when we pray, we pray according to his will and not according to our will. We're not trying to manipulate God into doing what we want him to do. No, we're praying in such a way that God will enable us to do what he wants done. That's the difference. That's what we're shooting for. And yet I hear so many people writing books and preaching sermons on how we can get God to answer our prayers. Well, you know what? It's about us lining up with God's will. That's what, that's what matters. It's not about how you can win the Florida lottery, as I was relating to you earlier tonight, you know, how, how you can, oh, if I can, if I just win the Florida lottery, if God will just help me to win the lottery, I'll be able to help lots of people. Well, the truth is, if you're not helping people now with whatever God gives you to bless people with, you're not going to help them when you become a multi-billionaire either. Right. It's just, that's just the reality of it. You do what you can with what you have. It's about according to his will. That, that's what our prayers must be about. Anybody want to add anything before we go on? Okay, verse 20, if you, if you would, Ed. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. There are times when Jesus plainly declares that he is the Christ. John 4, 25 and 26, a woman said unto him, I know that Messiah comes, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. There are times that Jesus asks that no one reveal that he is the Christ. It may be for the reason given by John Locke in Kaufman's commentary. John Locke, whose writings had such influence on Alexander Campbell, noted that the difficulties confronting Christ were almost insurmountable. It was his purpose to die for the sins of the whole world, but if at the instigation of Satan, evil men would make it appear that he died in an attempt to take Caesar's throne, the will of God would have been circumvented. 
so it is possible that Jesus didn't want the people misunderstanding why he was come and didn't want people misinterpreting his purpose as seeking an earthly kingdom. John 18:36. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. So the point is that Jesus wasn't looking for a photo op. He wasn't a typical politician who looked for every, you know, so when he would tell people, you know, don't publish it about, it, it was, you know, for reasons, he, he probably wanted people to have, understand the right reasons. He, he was promoting the truth is what Jesus was all about. And so we want to do the same thing. We want to follow the same thing. Okay, verse 21. Verse 21. And from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Jesus understood where Peter's reasoning was coming from. Peter's mind was being influenced by the powers of darkness, but Peter was not demon-possessed and did not need deliverance as some have falsely claimed. They who teach that a Christian can be possessed by a demon look to this instance to justify that teaching. But teaching that born-again Christians need deliverance from devils is a heresy and borders on blasphemy of the Holy Ghost, Matthew 12, 24 through 32, Mark 3, 22 through 30. Mark 3, 29 through 30, But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation, because they said he hath an unclean spirit. So when Jesus gave this teaching about the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, right? He, which he, it, it's addressed in Matthew 12, 24 through 32, and Mark 3, 22 through 30. In Mark, he says why he gave that read, why he gave that teaching. Verse 30, because they said he hath an unclean spirit, because they accused Jesus of doing all these miracles because of a devil that was in him. And the idea that, that you have Christian ministers teaching the flock that they need deliverance from devils. You know, look, like I said, this borders blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. And I just want you to understand, when I first got saved, I was in Derek Prince's ministry. That's where I got saved. I used to go to Derek Prince's house for Bible studies every week. Fortunately, the Lord got me out of there. Very, very Within a, month, within a couple of months, he got me out of that group, thank God. But I, I battled with that stuff in my mind until the Lord taught me his word. It is a terrible heresy. And the truth of the matter is, is that God will not share his temple with any devil. You are the temple of the living God. Your, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Now, we might be oppressed and our minds might be embattled by the powers of darkness, but they will never possess us and we don't we won't need deliverance from some demon we just need to fight the good fight of faith cast down every imagination and every thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of god you're gonna to have to learn how to fight the spiritual battle but it's not that some demon possesses a christian no that is a heresy and like i said it borders on blasphemy of the holy ghost Okay, verse 24, Ed. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. 
For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? How anyone can read this portion of Scripture and conclude that God is not demanding anything from us is deceived, and I fear for their souls. I mean, my goodness, you know, when the Lord is warning us that we can gain the whole world and lose our own soul, hardly sounds like Calvinism being taught there. He's telling you, that's your choice. You, you know, you could, you could gain the whole world, but lose your soul. Who is Jesus talking to here? He is talking to those that are disciples. And the fact that he is saying that you, if you're going to come after me, you have to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow. Whosoever will save his life will lose it. Whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. How can someone read this thing and say, you know, the grace of God is not requiring anything of us. God is not, he doesn't care about what. No, he cares very much. He is demanding things from us. We have to take our salvation seriously. We have to sit down and count the cost. We have to strive to enter into the straight gate. For many shall seek to enter in and shall not be able. The problem that I see is that a lot of Christians think that they've already entered into the straight gate. They think that just because they prayed the sinner's prayer and got born again, that they've entered into the straight gate. I'm sorry, that's not what that's not what entering into the straight gate is. So I'll leave it for you know, I've I've taught on that many times before, so we're not going to spend much more time on that for tonight. All right, verse twenty seven, if you would Ed. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels. Then he shall reward every man according to his works. In other words, our judgment hinges on what we do. Romans 2, 6 through 11. Who will render to every man according to his deeds? To them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that works good, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile, for there is no respect of persons with God. He is going to render to every man according to his deeds. And, you know, so I hear so many Christians say, well, you know, all we have to do is love. It's all about love. And I'm just going to point you to verse 8. If you don't obey the truth, if you don't obey the truth, you can say you love and every. But, you know, Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So if you do not obey the truth, what awaits is indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish. I mean, that's just what the scripture says. It is according to our works. It is according to what we choose to do. All right, verse 28. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. I think this event, is when the new covenant is established upon the death and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus had to shed his blood in order for the covenant to be established. Hebrews 9, 16 through 26, For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is no strength at all while the testator liveth. Until Jesus died, 
there could be no new covenant enacted. No one could enter into the kingdom because the kingdom could not come until Jesus died and resurrected. Therefore, Judas Iscariot did not live to see Jesus coming and establishing his kingdom, John 17, 12. So when Jesus said, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death, well, that was most of them. But Judas Iscariot was standing there, and he did taste of death before he saw the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And so I'm addressing that point about the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. When did that take place? Okay, if you'll pick it up, we're going to keep reading it here in Hebrews 9, verse 18. Um, whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people, according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament, which God has enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the pattern of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifice than these. Jesus could not perform the duty of a high priest the offering up of his blood and the sprinkling of the vessels, we are those vessels, until his blood has been shed, and he had to be resurrected in order to perform that duty. And we know he has resurrected, and we are all have experienced that sprinkling and have been ushered into his kingdom because we have received the Holy Spirit which could not be made available until Jesus was glorified. John 7:39. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Je that Jesus was not yet glorified. And we know by Jesus was not glorified until he laid down his life. John 10:15 through 18 and 17:11. John 17, 1 through 5, These words spake Jesus and lifted up, his, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hours come, glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. So when did the Son of Man come, and, you know, with the glory of his kingdom? Everybody thinks preaches it teaches that this is when he's coming you know the second time but the fact is is that the kingdom of god didn't get delivered unto men until jesus was crucified and resurrected and we know in john 7:39 that we can't receive the holy ghost until jesus is glorified so why is john 17 1 through 5 important because this is Jesus praying to the Father to glorify me. The hour is come. Glorify thy Son. Verse 5, O Father, now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self. You know, it's not until this point that he gets offered up on the cross and he is resurrected that the Holy Ghost could be given to men and they could be born again. Remember, on the first day of the resurrection in John chapter 20, Jesus walks into the closed room where many of the disciples were gathered, and he breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. This was not the baptism of the Holy Ghost. This was them being born again for the first time. 
the baptism of the Holy Ghost didn't take place for another 50 days on the day of Pentecost. So now Jesus has come and the glory of his kingdom is being, the kingdom of God is being opened up to people. They're being born again. Let's keep reading and, and we're, we're almost about to finish. You pick up at his kingdom. His kingdom was not open to us until he was sacrificed and resurrected and we could receive the Holy Ghost whereby we could be born of the Spirit, born again, John 3, 5 through 7, until Christ offered up his blood, which we could not be born again and enter into his kingdom. John 3, 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. You can't enter into the kingdom of God unless you're born of the Spirit, but the Spirit was not given until Jesus was glorified. Okay? This is the point. So when he says there are many of you who will not taste of death uh, until, you know, uh, you see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom, this is not the second coming that Jesus is talking about. This is about him delivering the kingdom of God to mankind. Up until this time, people had not entered into the kingdom. And I know that many argue and say, oh, well, what about all the Old Testament saints? Well, brethren, all I can tell, point to you is how, what Jesus said when he talked about the Lazarus and the rich man. Uh, where, where, did, where was Lazarus? Because Jesus hadn't died and been resurrected yet. He was in Abraham's bosom. He's in this place reserved. But the kingdom of God hadn't been opened yet. People haven't been born of the Spirit of God because the Spirit of God hadn't been given to men yet. Up until that time, he would come upon them, but he didn't dwell in them. So that we've made that point before. But So that's the point. So when Jesus says that there be some standing here which shall not taste of death, well, that was most of them, but Judas Iscariot did taste of death because he hung himself before Jesus resurrected, as we all know. Okay, that's it for tonight, brethren. It, would anybody like to add anything to uh, about anything before we close out tonight? Okay. I don't know how many made us the call tonight. I know we weren't going to have many tonight because of diff different circumstances, but they'll be listening on, on the uh, to the recording. So one last time, anybody have anything they'd like to add? And again, Carl, brethren, uh, yes, go ahead. Can I ask a question? And I'm not yes. trying to trick or, you know, disrupt or anything. No, absolutely. Yeah. 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 I believe that the Spirit of God came upon men in the Old Testament, and they were moved by God. And yes, I believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit and and everything that you just said. But there are a couple of scriptures in the book of Luke. When Mary went to see Elizabeth, it says the baby John the Baptist leaped in her womb, and she was full of the Holy Spirit, and that Correct. she began to prophesy. So I was just wondering, you know, and there's a couple of times in there where it says different people that were devout and full of the Holy Spirit. That's Spirit. true. You're, you're absolutely right. But remember, Jesus prays in, in John, uh, or he doesn't pray. He explains to the disciples in, in chapter 14, 15, and 16. And he says, listen, I'm going to pray for you that another comforter, mm -hmm. in other words, they haven't received the comforter, another comforter will come, and he will dwell in you, and he shall be in you. You see, and that's the thing is that they, the Holy Ghost didn't dwell in people because the temp, they, they weren't the temple. They couldn't. This is a new covenant uh, precept. Uh, up until that time, people had to go to Jerusalem to the temple. We all know and understand that. Jesus comes along and talks to the woman at the well and says, you know, she says, you know, you say as a Jew that we have to go to Jerusalem. Our fathers say it's in this mountain, of course, because 
they were Samaritans. They were part of the Northern Kingdom at one point. So they thought they had to worship at Bethel and, you know, and didn't have to go to Jerusalem because that's what Jeroboam had decried, which was also false. But Jesus says to her, look, the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers shall worship. They don't have to go to Jerusalem. That's a new covenant thing. But, the indwelling of the Holy Ghost, where he dwells with us continually, that is something that is exclusive to the New Covenant. And the New Covenant wasn't enacted until Jesus was crucified and resurrected. And that, that's the point that, um, you know, so when we hear, when we read that, that you know, that, the ba- that he was full of the Holy Ghost from the womb, well, he was, he was, the Holy Ghost was upon him. But he didn't right, dwell right. within him. That's the difference. You know, I, know I, 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 I kind of follow that reasoning. And right. if I could just read it. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with a Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit. So I believe that the Holy Spirit was on John. Yes. While he was in her womb. And being on John, that's why it says here, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. Right, and she was filled. Right, but the indwelling. In other words, as New Covenant believers, right, the Holy Ghost is with us all the time. He he doesn't Mm -hmm. come on us at special times. He's with us all the time. That, That is something that the Old Testament saints didn't experience. You know, it, it, uh, even when I know people point to uh, David's prayer, it says, you know, take not thy Holy Spirit from thee. But yes, right. but, and, and that is true. But th- if we understand and study the scriptures, we realize that, you know, particularly when John seven thirty nine says that, you know, the spirit had not yet been given because Jesus was not, had not yet been glorified. We understand clearly that there's a difference. And, again, I point to the fact that the Old Testament saints, you know, the kingdom of God, it it doesn't talk that they, the kingdom of God is a new covenant phrase. Right, right. It is a new covenant thing, you know, it, and so those are the things that I point people to. And there is a, there, 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 there are, there's important distinctions to be made about that because, if we try to say that everything that happened in the New, that's happened in the New Testament already happened in the Old Testament, then we are taking from the glory of the Son. We are taking from the glory of God, because it was not so. There are distinct differences that have been enacted as a result of Christ offering up of Himself that is exclusive to that, that no one could partake of until that time. And so we are blessed. And Jesus said, you know, to the disciples, said, you know, blessed are your eyes because you're seeing and you're hearing things that prophets of old desired to see and hear and did not hear. But even more than that, now that they've been born again, my goodness, we are blessed today being in the new covenant to partake in things that even Adam and Eve did not get to take part in because the Holy Ghost did not dwell in them. It says that the Lord came down every day and had fellowship with them in the cool of the day. They didn't have the Holy Ghost dwelling in them. Even though they they weren't living in sin, it just, this is a new covenant. I don't want to say phenomena because, you know, it's not a phenomenon. It's just a new covenant precept that's been reserved for those who have accepted Jesus Christ is their Messiah and have been washed in his blood. And that couldn't have happened until he shed his blood. And that's why it's important, because we don't want to take any honor or any glory from the Son for all that he's done. I hope that helps. Very much. Thank you. Okay, great. Anybody else have anything they want to share or ask or whatever? I don't have the answer to everything, brethren. I wish I did, but I don't. But I know I do know the one who does, so we'll keep seeking him. <laughs> Amen.
Amen. Anyone else want to share anything before we close it out in prayer? Hey, Carlos. Yes, John O. Yes, can we say that in the Old Testament they were visited by the Spirit like Elizabeth, but uh, not uh, the Spirit was not dwelling in them? Yes, that's what I that's what I believe according to the scriptures. They weren't born again. You know, because in, in in order to be born again, you have to be born of the spirit. But the spirit ha isn't given until Jesus is glorified. And so that that's the point. And that's another reason, I mean to to just elaborate on it a little bit. You know, people say, "Well, why?" You know, the Lord was so merciful with people in the Old Testament. I mean, yes, his judgments were swift and they were deadly, but also he was very merciful. And because they they weren't born again, because they hadn't received the divine, uh, you know, as Peter says, the, the, the divine nature. They weren't partakers of the divine nature. You know, so we see that, you know, the men, men of God did egregious things, but God had mercy on them as long as they were willing to repent. But and we have an advantage in that we have the presence of God dwelling with us. He doesn't just come upon us periodically, you know, when we're in prayer or whatever. No, the Holy Ghost dwells with us all the time. Unfortunately, we just don't don't sense it enough and don't. But the more we read and study and are taught, the more we understand. And, and actually, I must say that, that, when I was a young Christian, a lot of times I'd feel like, oh, wow, Lord, are, are you with me? You know, why Why don't I sense you? You know, the, now because of my understanding of the word, I actually have that assurance. Man, I, I know he's with me all the time. I might be going through trials and tribulations, but I know he's with me. And uh, so, yeah, that being born again, is, is it's a new covenant precept. It could only happen in the New Covenant. But I believe that the saints of old, the Holy Ghost would come upon them. He just didn't dwell in them because they weren't the temple. And they, they, they couldn't be the temple until Jesus shed his blood. And, and that's why I was quoting those scriptures in Hebrews. Uh, if you, you know go back and look at them, uh, that it was so important about the testament dedicated, you know, yeah, it had to be the blood of Jesus that, that dedicates this New Testament. And and he had to die and, and be resurrected of the Spirit before the Spirit could be given to men. So th that's my contention. But, you know, check out all those scriptures that I, I shared tonight. We can always go back on the website. Or on the YouTube channel and and look you know look at them, list them out. That's the best I can do. <laughs> okay. All right. Anybody else have anything you'd like to share? Okay. Well, Carl opened us in prayer. Uh, anybody have it in their heart to close us in prayer? That's down to me and you. That when we have such a short amount of people on here, do you want to do the honors? Okay, you volunteered me then. Yeah. <laughs> no problem. All right. Well, Lord, Lord, we, we love you, mighty God. We're just grateful. It's not about the numbers, Lord. You said that wherever two or three were gathered together, you'd be in our midst. And I am so happy that you're with us, Lord, and that you bless us from your word. Father, help us to grow, to know you better, to understand you, to have the love of the truth. Help us speak the truth in love and look out for the well-being of others, Almighty God. I just pray that you'd help us. Give us, quicken your word to us and give us wisdom to relate to people and, and help us, Lord, to point them to you, Almighty God, the word of the living God, the word that was made flesh. We so love you, Jesus. We so appreciate you, Lord. Father, please look at all those that are on the call, not just the ones that are on tonight, but you know who is part of this call. I pray that you look upon them and their families and bless them mightily, work in every heart to do your will, Almighty God. Encourage hearts, 
strengthen their faith. Help us, Almighty God, to be a blessing to you and a blessing to others, Lord. We so love you. We appreciate you, mighty God. Thank you, Lord. Bless your holy name. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let me uh, let me turn off the recording.